The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel. I'm the host for this podcast, and my husband, Steve Siegel, is the producer for this podcast. Today's episode, I believe, is number 167. Please be sure and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, but also please check out our YouTube channel and subscribe there as well. When you subscribe, listen, and review our podcast, whether it's on your podcast platform or YouTube, it helps people find us. More people find us and receive the message of hope and help. We're doing something a little bit different with today's podcast. We will be interviewing Dan Schneider, a Louisiana pharmacist just featured in a recently released released true crime docu-series, that's a mouthful, docu-series, The Pharmacist, now trending on Netflix. Because Dan's story is so involved, the docu-series is a four-hour-long, four-hour-long episodes, we felt that one podcast episode was not enough. Therefore, today's episode will focus on the first chapter of Dan's intimate and intense story, mostly about his role as a dad, his campaign to identify his son's killer, and how this led to his gathering evidence against a prolific pill mill doctor in New Orleans. Tomorrow, we will publish the second chapter, which is all about Dan's mission to help eradicate the addiction pandemic in a courageous quest to not only track down purveyors of dangerous opioids, but also to go after their manufacturer. Please welcome Dan Schneider. So Dan, thank you so much for just, you're a big celebrity now, so thank you for being willing to talk to us here on the Addiction Podcast. You're welcome, very welcome. I want you to um, start with how you got involved in this whole area. Um, I mean, we're going to talk about the documentary and that whole thing, but our podcast is about addiction, and that means that you have had some some contact with that that yes. led you down your road. And tell us what that was. Well, it's a, it's a big story, and, and, and it, it kind of is in the docuseries, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of reemphasize it. The... Uh, As a pharmacist, you know, you're supposed to know things about addiction. And I did see uh, in my career in pharmacy before my son died, I saw a number of people who were addicted to prescription drugs. I didn't know much about street drugs. And I didn't really have a good opinion of them. And I had uh, a little bit compassion, but not a serious compassion. Uh, I uh, never treated them badly, uh, but m- many times I would just kind of run them off, say I didn't have the medication if I thought it was a suspicious prescription. I-, I didn't really go out of my way to try to talk to them about their problem, okay? And I have uh, a little guilt about that now, uh, that that I wasn't enlightened at that stage. And actually in pharmacy school then, and I don't know about now, but uh, they-, they taught us very little about addiction. Okay, and, and, and even less about street trucks. Okay, so, uh, so what happened was uh, I got slapped in the face uh, with, with a son that had, had, was a great kid that didn't, never got a detention at school, never fought, was a mediator between uh, kind of a peacenik type of kid. He, he loved the Beatles, and, uh, but he was a real peaceful, nonviolent type of kid. And uh, sentimental and loved his sister and loved his mom and dad and uh, just a great kid, okay? And uh, you know, he had a little uh, interaction with marijuana and, and I didn't like him smoking marijuana, okay? And I got on his case and I told him about the story about it can be a gateway drug and, you know, and I, I didn't really tell him this directly, but in my mind, I kind of said, if this is the worst he does, I can live with this. Okay, and I still don't know whether that was quite a mistake, but uh, uh, but that's how I, I felt. Even though I will say this, I didn't tell him that. I I, I kind of got on his case about it and uh, 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 punished him a little bit for it and whatnot. And I, I do think that subsided. 
I had no idea he'd ever done any serious drug use. Okay. And we didn't find out out until we got a knock on the door at two o'clock in the morning, April 14th, 1999. And two policemen showed up and said, uh, your son's been murdered in the ninth ward. And uh, I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't really believe it. Uh, I, 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 one, I said, I said, well, what hospitals he's in? Because I, I must have missed the dead part of it. Uh, I thought he'd been shot, maybe. Okay, or maybe they did say he was shot in the night. Well, I, I don't remember, but I, I, I pictured we could go to the hospital. Okay, and in, in, in some kind of way, he'd be okay. And uh, no, they said he, he's dead. He, you know, you can you can go see him at the morgue. Okay, and so. Uh, and it was not just his dad, like, what the hell was he doing in the Ninth Ward? Uh, and, and, and the Ninth Ward from, is, 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 a, is a little spot between the city. It's in New Orleans, uh, but it's our, our parish is a residential suburban uh, parish. And it, but New Orleans is only 10 minutes away. And you enter New Orleans through the Ninth Ward. It is kind of a known as a drug area and a low economic area and a, a crime associated with drug area. And so it was hard for me to process, but we, we actually got in the police call and I said, I, I want to see where this was at. And, you know, my wife wasn't believing he was dead and she surely wasn't believing he was doing drugs. And I'm riding up there and I'm looking at the neighborhood and all of a sudden I said, he must have been up here for drugs. <laughs> you know, and, and and so we had two whammies. Uh, you know, the stigma back then was horrible. I I, I had a, a low esteem for drug addicts. Okay, and so I had to deal with not only losing my son immediately, but realizing he was apparently a drug addict or he was fooling with drugs and got killed. And it was embarrassing. It was a, a stigma, and uh, you know, you so a, any event though. I reflected on the fact that basically all of his life he was a good kid. And this was, was a, you know, I, I eventually got to the stage where I could investigate his drug use. And it was after he was dead. When, how old was he when you found out he was using marijuana? How long before he died? Because he died at se seven, 19, right? Uh, he died at 22. 22. Okay, so 22. Okay. how old was he when you discovered he was using marijuana? I discovered he was using marijuana, I'm going to say at age 17 or 18. Okay. okay. And, uh, but later in talking to him, he had actually started marijuana and probably very limited, but he had smoked his first joint when he was like 13 years old. Wow. And let me tell you the story about that. A sad story about that was I asked him, I said, geez, I'm Danny. I said, you know, what did, he says, well, dad, you know, he says a lot of people do it. I was interested. I was curious. And, and, and he said, you know, he knew more than me that, you know, some of our family members are doing it. Some cousins that we had. And, and I really didn't know. I was naive to that. Okay. And he kind of like justified it. But then he also said, yeah, but I, I know you, you talk to me about drugs and everybody's talking about drugs. And I was really afraid to do it. And, and, and I knew it was illegal and I really didn't have the nerve to do it. And I said, but I was in middle school and a, and a good friend. Who, who who was trying to talk me into smoking pot pretty much, okay? He, he finally said, look, he says, come to my house. My mom smokes with us. Wow. That's right. So the first time I'm, my son smoked, he smoked in a safe, secure place with another adult, which again gave him the green light, okay? And of course, I didn't find that out for, to, to, to four years later, okay? Uh, but, you know, I don't think he had a really deep, deep, serious marijuana problem. He, he lived with us and, you know, but on and off he did. And so, but the, the other drug use, uh, you know, I found out that the other drug use was relatively short. He, he was really kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time in the sense that you don't usually get murdered that quick when you start fooling with this. Okay. Uh, from my understanding, he was in that neighborhood probably no more than six or eight weeks Okay, and uh, uh, and he just got a got a bad break. But in any event, I all of a sudden, then it's, it's it's complicated. But all at the same time, I had to realize he had a he, someone had killed him. <laughs> you know, it, it, that's the other thing. You got to start realizing now. I'm dealing with a murderer. Okay, 
and and different it, than an overdose when so, when someone yeah well it wasn't an overdose it's really right. more complicated than that having, having died of an overdose would have been ridiculously horrible but we had a lot more than just dealing with him dying uh, yes, from you drug did. use okay yep. and so you know, kind of naively i knew I knew we probably would have a little bit of difficulty, but I thought we could go to the police and kind of patch it up and tell them what kind of kid he was and offer help. And, and this was an unusual situation. And, and I thought I could I could get some cooperation out of them and they would they would treat him with some degree of respect and really try to find his killer. Well, that's a long story, and I could you know I could expand on that, but I, I, I think it's in the docu series. I had tremendous difficulties with police. Okay, uh, they disrespected my son almost from the beginning. Now there were a few cops in there that were less disrespectful, okay? and we even had one cop that I'll call a good cop. Okay, but we also had the the, the, the top guy in in the district there was the chief, I guess you'd call him. Okay, our captain. Uh, he 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 was horrible. Okay, but worse than that. The sergeant that was actually in charge of my son's case was absolutely horrible. In the middle was a guy, a lieutenant, who was between the sergeant and the captain, who were buddies, and turned out to both be bad cops in my eyes, okay? The lieutenant was a good cop, and but I had gotten threatened early on by this sergeant who's a bad cop, and I had got threatened that, you know, if you if you continue to work on this case or call us or bug us or do anything in regards to this case, I'll throw your son's case away. Wow. Yeah. So, so then I was stuck with wanting to help. Okay. I, I still didn't really want to do this investigation on my own, but I wanted to be able to assist a little bit. Okay. But I also, when I seen and heard what this guy told me, I said, <laughs> This this isn't going right. I mean, how 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 are they ever going to solve this murder or can to solve this murder with the attitude that they have? Uh, and and just to give you an example, they when I first went and talked to the the, 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 the police, they you know I try to say you know my son's a good kid and and I'm trying to paint a good picture of him because I know they're going to treat him as another drug deal gone bad, okay? And him a typical addict, okay? And having a bad attitude about that, okay? And he wasn't that, okay? And if he would have been that, they still should have worked, okay? But but any event, he wasn't that, okay? Even though he was out there that night, that was not his life, okay? He was working, had a girlfriend, a whole nine yards, okay? And so they said, well, yeah, well, we, we hear that, Mr. Snyder, but, you know, uh, you know, his use was probably a lot worse than what you knew, okay? And so I said, no, I said, I don't think so. I said, but, you know, I'm still studying it myself, and I, I'll provide y'all with any information I can to help. Well, Mr. Snyder, just rest assured that we are, uh, uh, no matter what the circumstances are, are, are we are going to work this case and, and solve it. I tried to take them at their word. But then I, I went home, and I got a phone call from uh, where he worked at, at Pizza Hut. He was a, a delivery driver at Pizza Hut. Okay. And the manager called me from Pizza Hut, and they said, Mrs. Snyder, the police was just here questioning about uh, Danny. I said, well, that's good. I said, I, I told him to check everything out, okay? He said, yeah, but they only asked one thing. I said, well, what did they ask? How much was he stealing? <gasps> Seriously? Said, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the only question they asked. Okay. And I said, well, and, you know, but, hey, I, I'm, I'm trying to be open-minded. Well, she says, that kid never stole a penny. He was my best driver. Wow. Right, right. So then I called them up, and I guess I did create a little even more for it. I called them up and kind of got on their case. I said, well, wait a second. You're supposed to be looking for the killer, okay? And if you was going to go down and try to find out, like, maybe he had some connection with somebody down there or something, okay? But just try to find out how much he was stealing. <laughs> I mean, what's going on here? Oh, well, Mr. Snyder, you know, we're we trying to figure out what this degree of his habit was and, and whatnot. And I said, wow, you, it, it was screwed up. Okay, so so anything, they, let me tell you what they tell me now. They said, well, he had to be getting money from somewhere, okay, because we, we feel like his habit was pretty big. And I said, well, where did you get that from? Well, we just, you know, we know these kind of things, okay? <laughs> and I said, well, he says, look, Mr. Snyder, he's he probably stealing from you. 
And that like was a punch in the gut, okay? Now, now look, now that I've dealt with addiction, there are tons of kids that steal from their parents. So even at that moment, you know, I looked at my kid as not the typical addict. And, and he really wasn't the typical addict, but he was an addict at that time, okay? So anything's possible. What's unusual is in my house, I, uh, I own some apartments, like 16 apartments. And he, he would help cut the grass and paint and clean the toilets and unclog the toilets and whatnot. And I paid him a little something, okay? And so we, we kind of cheated a little bit. You know, we would take a little piece of the rent, you know, a couple hundred dollars every month or whatnot, and we'd put it aside. And we really, I hate to say it, we, I probably shouldn't say it, we, we wouldn't really report that, okay? <laughs> Okay. okay. So we had a little cash cow and it would build up to a couple of thousand dollars. Okay. And we would spend that cash. Okay. But it was in, it was like an envelope in a, in a, uh, a drawer or a closet. Okay. And the kids knew about it. And in fact, I told them they could, if they had an emergency or something and they needed money, they could go to that envelope. They had a little thing that they had a sign, you know, what the reason was and what the date was and all that kind of, we had, we had a plan. So, man, when they told me that, I said, oh, my God, let me go home and check. And I went and checked, and it wasn't a dollar short. And I'm saying, my God, these guys, these guys are crazy. You know, you could just tell that, that you know, he, he's a piece of trash, basically, without maybe, and, and although one of them actually said that, but, but I mean, it, it, they treated him like that, so, like, how hard are they going to work? Okay. Yep. They took then, Danny's death and they put it into the same category as really drug deals gone bad and, you know, with addicts and they just put it in the same category. They did. Well, actually, technically speaking, it sort of was a drug deal going bad. But the, the, in a, what I don't want to happen now is uh, my, my son was probably an unusual addict that it was a little bit better. But uh, most of these addicts were good kids at some time. OK, uh, there's just some of them that that maybe turn bad and lose total control and start stealing and, and start committing uh, crimes and whatnot. And he hadn't gotten there. Uh, I would hope to think he never would have got there. We would have caught him and he had good parents and I think we could have turned it around. But uh, so he didn't exactly fit in the mode. And I hate to say it, but if they really would have thought, believed what I said in it, this is sad too, but if they really, really believed what I said, they would have worked on it. If it had been a kid that 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 it wasn't drugs, in fact, somebody thought since he delivered pizza, he was delivering pizza up there, and got killed. Had that been the case, and it wasn't, okay. Had that been the case, and he was just delivering pizza up there, they would have looked for his killer. They would have treated this entirely different, okay. Uh, but they knew he was up there to buy, try to buy drugs, and. I openly admitted that, okay? Uh, I figured it out shortly after his death. And uh, so in any event, uh, so then I got to deal with, uh, I know I got to work the case because, but I can't let that guy know that I'm going above him or below him. And so the, the good cop in the middle kind of helps me out a little bit. He kind of keeps me informed and he doesn't tell his boss and he doesn't tell the bottom guy. Okay? He's in an awkward position too, okay? Well, in any event, we have a, a big, that, that, that bad cop, the sergeant, called me one night. We, they, they didn't want, to, want us to do anything, okay? And we went out shortly after his death, and we went to put posters up, and we started, we put a reward up, and, and we were already starting an investigation, and that kind of ticked them off, because we started maybe before they started, okay? And uh, so, so in any event, I had asked them about the reward. They said, you shouldn't have put the reward up. And I said, well, I already did. So, well, look, we're not going to advertise that reward yet because we, we think we can do better without it, okay, even though we had already put posters up. I said, well, look, okay, fine. You guys know what you're doing. We won't put the reward up. Well, about maybe 10 days go up by, and finally the good cop, I think, I think he wanted the reward up to begin with. But the good cop winds up convincing them that, well, look, we might as well put the reward up, okay. And so uh, they had a press conference, and I went to this press conference. And I cried and took a picture of me. And in fact, that show was in a documentary. I'm on a stage and my son's picture's with me and I'm crying and I'm begging for somebody to come forward, okay? Well, I go home that night and I'm watching the 10 o'clock news, okay? And uh, I'm watching myself and I'm 
it's kind of a good thing though. I finally, well, I finally got a chance to do something. Now people know about the reward and I cried and maybe some that'll touch somebody. Okay. And I get this, after that, I get this phone call and it's this no good cop who at that time, I didn't even know who he was. Okay. And he's, he's, well, your kid was a sprawled brat. He was, a, you know, he was a drug head. He, 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 you know, he was, a, you know, these kids are all sprawled. I, I know what I'm doing. You got to butt out. Don't go above me. Don't go below me. And I was just blown away with this phone call. So this is how the recording started. Okay. I wasn't recording. I didn't think about recording anything. Okay. But he hit me so hard and so shocked. Okay. That I, after I got off the phone, I, I notated everything he did, I, everything he said. I tried to remember everything he said, okay? And I said, after that, I said, they're not going to beat me after this, okay? I went out and bought $300 worth of recording. Back then, that was a bunch of money. I, uh, I, had a, uh, I had a hookup in my car. I had handheld recorders. I had a link in my house. Every time the phone rang, the recorder picked up and uh, recorded everything, okay? Which is kind of funny because it recorded a lot of our normal life. Uh, <laughs> in the house, we, and so, uh, and it eventually did help me solve the case. Okay, uh, so, uh, and, and it's and, too bad you didn't get a recording of that one particular phone call, though. That's pretty. I, that's I, pretty I, missed, bad. I, I did miss the most dramatic phone call, but I will tell you the next altercation with this guy is about maybe a couple of weeks go by, and we, I'm telling the St. Bernard Police Department in my community which is out of the jurisdiction where my son got killed, uh, they're very friendly, but it's not their jurisdiction. There's only so much they can do, okay? And there's a rivalry between New Orleans and St. Bernard police, in a sense, okay? And so, but but eventually they, they know. So I tell St. Bernard what the hell New Orleans is doing. I, I'm thinking about going to the superintendent of police, in, in, and I'm told by a, by a sheriff who's in the documentary, Jack Stevens, I'm told by him, he says, well, Dan, I don't think I would do that yet. Uh, uh, you know, th this cop was probably just blowing steam. You know, they, they got a lot of pressure on him. And, and uh, you know, he's just trying to rattle your cage a little bit. And, you know, I really still think he's probably going to work the case. So I, I continued to let the case uh, move forward with this guy. But it wasn't getting any better. And it was tremendously awkward uh, not being able to talk to him. Okay. And so finally... St. Bernard got a New Orleans, uh, one of their people who was used to be a New Orleans policeman, and he was going to go to the, the, the New Orleans Police Department from St. Bernard, and he was going to bridge the gap, in a sense. He, he was going to try to smooth things over, and we wanted to start all over. So finally, we arranged a meeting with the uh, sergeant, which I call a bad cop, without naming him, okay? Uh, he, we have this big meeting, in it, and, it, and he's, he's a night sergeant, so... Uh, so we got to go there at night. So we, me and my wife go there at like 12 o'clock at night, okay? And we're in the police station, and we're downstairs in the waiting room. And she's got to go in the bathroom, though, because she's got to turn her recorder on. She's wired. Even though we were going there to, to uh, patch things up, I didn't trust this guy anymore. I, 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 I can't imagine why. I can't imagine yeah. why. I mean, right, you know, right. he's been so helpful. Right. So... She wears a wire, and we go upstairs finally in, in the meeting room, okay? And uh, there's him and uh, uh, maybe four or five other uh, police. So it's not, you know, they're witnesses to this thing, okay? And I feel like we're going to pass things up. Oh, and there's another thing. We're going to get his belongings back that night. Because at first they were, they were keeping some of his belongings. Uh, you know, he had like a little piece metal that he wore. He had something from his girlfriend, uh, uh, I think he had some clothing artifacts or some books or something like that. And, and at first, when I asked for that stuff, they said, well, it might be evidence. So I said, well, fine, keep it. Okay. But now they, the, the lieutenant, the good cop, looks at it and says, yeah, it's not really evidence anymore. So you can have it back. And at that meeting tonight, and he had hoped for that meeting was going to patch things up. Okay. And so at that meeting tonight, you, you'll be given that, that back, you and your wife. Okay. So we go upstairs in the meeting room and, uh, the bad cop stands up at the beginning of the meeting and he starts reaming my ass. Okay. He starts just like he did on the phone that night with me. Oh, your son's a no good son of a bitch. And, 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 and you, you, you didn't listen to me. You went over my head. Okay. Well, my wife gets so upset. She jumps across the table to slug his ass. 
I got to grab her and pull her back. You see, I, I had a little bit tougher skin at this point in time, and, and, and I, I was holding back because I still was told that don't blow this thing up. They may still solve this case. But my wife, when she started talking about me and my son, and she had never heard this ass before, okay? And so uh, she reacted the way probably I should have reacted. Okay. Definitely uh, the way I would have reacted. Right, right. Well, I, I somehow held it together in the hopes that it would benefit the case. Okay. And for right or wrong, that's what I did. Okay. And so, so in any event, uh, me and my wife are just blown away. So the, the meeting abruptly ends. Okay. And we asked to get his belongings. I ain't giving them to you. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and he just decided himself he that's right wow so in any event we go downstairs it's 12 1 o'clock at night and we basically say we're not leaving the station seven or eight o'clock in the morning we're going to stay here all night okay and and we're going to call the superintendent now i, I don't care anymore the, the, the superintendent of the department's got to know what the hell is going on here. And I know it might blow the case, but I just can't take it anymore. Okay. Well, we're sitting there for about two hours, and then finally, apparently his buddies talked to him and said, you know, you might lose your job. I mean, you know, we, you know, we, and they didn't even know I had the tape of the incident. <laughs> okay. So, any event, uh, they talk him into coming down. No, no, he doesn't come down, but they come down and say, look, we, we've talked to him. He, he overreacted. We apologize for him. And uh, why don't we get back together? So, you know, maybe like two o'clock in the morning, now we go back upstairs to the same room. Okay. And she's got the recorder going again. <laughs> okay. But his, his tone has changed. Now he's, he's not really a truly apologetic, but he's somewhat reasonable. And I would imagine because maybe he did figure, well, maybe I went too strong here and maybe, you know, I'm, I might lose my job or whatever he figured, okay? And so we made a tiny bit of progress, but just to show you how little of progress we made, he, I said, well, well what about his belongings? And, uh, you know, we agreed that we were maybe going to work together a little bit better and so on and so forth. And, but I, I could tell he was just saying that just kind of covering his ass, okay? And we asked his belongings, and he said, no, I'm not going to give them to you. So it still ended. It still ended sour. But well, the next morning, uh, uh, Lieutenant Ali, the, the, the good cop, and I can, I'll can i mention his name. His name is David Ali, okay? And He's in the docuseries, isn't he? What's that name? Is he in the documentary? Did we get to see him in the documentary? No, he's not. You know, I wanted him in. I really wanted him in. And... Uh, you know, they don't like to speak bad They're about each other, okay? So he, he, he still wasn't going to, so to speak, rat them out or confirm how bad it was, okay? And, and then I, I will say this. I do think there was a point at which I almost got him to come forward, okay? But he got pretty sick. And to this day, I don't know. He may be, he may be, he may be dead now, okay? But he got a fairly decent sickness and I was, I was getting limited communication with him like through his wife and through one of his sons okay and I, I really don't know the end result but uh you know they kind of told me don't bug him anymore you know he's he's sick and so I just had to, I had to let it go but I, I think he really deserves some praise in in this thing okay he, he he helped me keep my sanity a little bit and helped me know a little bit was what was going on okay and so in any event uh the next morning he calls me and he apologized. He says, I, I says I'm, I'm so sorry. He says, I, you know, there's no way they should treat you and your wife that way. And I, I, I look, I, and he just tells me, he says, look, you know, if, if I could do something, I would, but you know, the captain is best buddies with the bad cop. And, and he's got the same attitude as the bad cop. Okay, so he says, but I do have your son's belongings. Okay, so if your wife and you want to come up here and pick them up, I got your belongings. And I'm sorry. I can't believe he wouldn't give you the belongings. It, it just gives you an example, you know, and I'm going to maybe in too much detail because we got a lot of story to tell here. Uh, but it, I, I, needless to say, you can see what's going on. And, and now I'm starting to say, forget it. You know, these, I can't count on anything from these guys. Okay. 
You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com, or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727 314 Seven zero eight zero, And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more information on our sponsor, Narconon Ojai, visit their website at narcononojai.org. That's N-A-R-C-O-N-O-N-O-J-A-I dot org. Or call 1-866-231-5924. That's 1-866-231-5924. Sometimes, the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one-hour consultation with Bobby. Well, but guess what? I get a surprise. Okay. Uh, It's nothing but maybe about a week later. Okay. I get a phone call in the middle of the night from the bad cop. And he says, Mr. Snyder, we arrested your son's killer. And I go, oh, thank God. Thank God. And I even kind of like start apologizing to him. Okay. I I don't, you know, I didn't, no, excuse me. I did have the recorder on. That's recorded. In fact, some of that's on the show. Okay. You're a wild man, Dan. <laughs> yeah. I'm semi apologizing to this guy because you know my goal was to find my son's killer. Okay, and not just for retribution. I figured if it seemed to me, it, my opinion of my son was so high that 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 if he could kill my son, he could kill anybody. But like as if he shouldn't have killed my son. Okay, you know, I know my son didn't give him a bad uh, a deal or or. Uh, try to rob him or, 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 you know, fight him or anything like that. He just wasn't that kind of kid. And yet, that kind of crap did happen up there, okay? And not that it's justified that you would kill somebody, but lots of times there's a, a, a friction between these people, okay? And so, uh, uh, let's see, where, where was I? I? I got myself sidetracked there. They arrested the killer. Yeah, they, oh, they arrested the killer. Okay, so, well, man, so I'm apologetic and thankful and whatnot. Well, the next morning, the lieutenant calls me, the good cop. Mr. Snyder, I'm sorry. That wasn't the killer. Now, I never ever talked to that sergeant again. He he disappeared and later on uh, went out on disability. Okay? I think that was the last case he worked. I don't know if they forced him out or whether he just knew he was in shit trouble. I, I, I don't know, but uh, in any event, the, the, the story with that was he, he they had arrested. Uh, they they had a witness. Crime Stoppers had called in, partly due to the reward, okay, and had told them who the killer was, and identified the killer. And eventually, we would come to find out that this person that called in was the witness in the documentary. And she had called in pretty daggone early. They had this information pretty doggone early, okay? And they finally located the kid that, that, that she named, and they brought him into the station with his grandmother, and the, and the bad cop interviewed him, okay? And according to the kid, and, I, you know, maybe he's okay to be rough, but he, you know, he's all over the kid. He says, man, look, he says, you better start talking, okay? You're facing the electric chair, you know? And so... So any event, the uh, that's what the kid tells me anyway, okay? And I don't doubt it from this asshole cop, okay? Which I don't think it's even the way you treat a potential killer. I mean, you, you, you want to get information out of him, okay? So any event, they scare the kid, and the kid says, well, I, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, but I know who did. And that's right up this bad cop's alley, because now he's got a witness, 
and he's got the killer, okay, and he's got a case, okay, because you need both, you know, you, okay, so, so in any event, he immediately turns the, the, uh, the killer into a witness. Okay. Later, I would find out from other police that it's police 101. You never, ever do that. You never take the suspect and immediately turn him into a witness. But this cop is hyperactive. He wants to solve. He wants to be right. Okay. So he gets the kid. Uh, there was another person mentioned called Scarface that might have been a killer. That was the word on the street. So he gets out of pictures of different skull faces, okay? And I think the kid might have even said it was a skull face that killed him, okay? And so in any event, he, he gets these pictures out, and he, the kid picks out a person. The problem is that person was in jail the night my son was killed. So that's not going to work. That's not going to work. I remember you saying in the documentary that it's like detective work 101. Yeah, you just, exactly. You just never do that. Yeah, you just never do that. And I, I wasn't, I didn't quite understand that at first, but I had to learn police logo. And, but later, the good cop, and later on, we got the cold case squad, which, by the way, the cold case squad did a pretty decent job on it. Of course, I had, I had already built the case for them and handed it to them. Uh, but at least they looked at the case that I gave them, and they said, my God, you ought to be working for us, Okay. And so, you know, uh, but everything I gave to the stupid sergeant, okay, it was, was trash, okay. So in any event, uh, so, so the good cop tells me, he says, this is, you know, so, so they, they, they bring the kid back in, okay. And they say, look, you son of a gun, uh, you, uh, you named the wrong person. You must be the killer. Oh, no, 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 I'm not really the killer. I, I just got nervous. Show me those pictures again. And so they, they, they start to get the pictures back out, and, they, and, and the kid says, look, I know where he lives. So, wow. Okay. So at this time, they still think maybe he's the witness, I guess, or want to think he's the witness. So they go to the house where he names this, this kid. By the way, the kid's name was Scarface. Okay. And it was only a few blocks from where my son was killed. Okay. And so they go to the, uh, the house, and they, they knock on the door, and the mom comes up, and she says, uh, he's in jail. <laughs> well, wait a second now. Okay. But Is somebody going to get a clue? I mean, <laughs> you know, someone's uh, not right here. Uh, well, hang on. Hang on. You don't know the whole story. It's a, everything's a little bit more complicated. Okay. So in any event, but they come to find out he was out. He wasn't in jail the night my son was killed. So he could still potentially be the killer. And what's really interesting is... He is, when he is arrested, which isn't the night my son is, uh, he's, is after my son gets killed, okay, he's got two guns. They arrest him with two guns. So now they, now all we got to do is get maybe a bullet match, okay, and then maybe the kid turns into a real witness. Maybe he made a mistake and, and oh, well, I'm hearing some of this and I'm still, I, I'm still believing in the, in the witness. I develop a relationship with the witness who is the killer. I, I'm meeting a number of times and befriending. I remember I saw that in the documentary. Yeah. He's helping me solve the case. He's going to help me find a gun. <laughs> I, know. I know, I know, I know, I know. So, so any event, uh, it's a long story. I can't even tell you the story about the bullet, but uh, basically, eventually, they, they can't supposedly get ballistics on the bullet. I'll tell you part of the story, kind of fast version. They can't get ballistics on the bullet. Okay. Why? Well, hang on. You know, I said the same damn thing. In fact, I'm almost saying, meantime, all this while, I'm bargaining with God, okay? Uh, there's a God element to this thing, okay? Initially, I'm mad at God, but then I turn to God out of desperation, okay? And and it and and I'm begging God to help. And, I, and I'm starting to bargain with God and say, look, God, if you help me get my son's killer, Okay, off the street. Okay, I'll go on a mission for you. And this is where my mission comes in. I'm learning what addiction's about. I'm learning. I'm learning what caused my son to go up there. Okay, and to take that kind of risk and how you know. And so during the process of this investigation, all 
I'm st also, I mean, I'm working 24 seven just about, okay, not only in the case, but I'm studying addiction. I'm studying when he did his drug, how he did his drug or the first time, you know? And so, yeah, I'm becoming a student of addiction. Okay. And it takes place over a number of years. Okay. And, and so any event, I'm back to with the, with the kid. Okay. So any event, eventually I'm about ready. Oops. What's happening? Uh, right now, I'm not seeing you. I must, I touched the screen. I must have did oh. <laughs> see if I can get you back. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to wonder what I should press to get you back. Yeah, let's see. Camera's not working. I can see you. I don't know if I got to go back in. Well, there we, there we are. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. So anyway, then, and, and, and I'm skipping some things, okay? But but the, the good cop says you got to go out and get a better witness, okay? Th th this kid is not a credible witness. He might even be the killer, okay? And I started suspecting that he could be the killer, but I didn't want to believe he was the killer because I needed a witness, okay? And naturally, the kid had a story about the second, uh, you know, it, 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 it's complicated, Okay. And I guess I was naive and still trying to figure out a way to solve it. And he was my best hope in a way for a while. Okay. And so eventually all this while, this is putting stress on my wife and my daughter and I'm going in and out of the ninth ward, that dangerous area. And people are starting to think that I'm going to get killed. Okay. And there was real, a real possibility. We found out later there were hits put out on me. They, they, they wanted to kill me. Okay. And, uh, the part of the story was to somewhere along the line, me and my wife in desperation to try to make this thing work. We went to the black churches in the area. It's predominantly a black area. We went to those churches. We prayed with the pastors and we happened to run into a Reverend Reed who's in the docu series. Okay. And he said, well, would you come to our meeting tonight? We have a recovery meeting. Okay. It's former drug addicts at the church. And, and maybe you can talk to them and, uh, uh, and whatnot. So anyway, we did. And then he commits to go with me and walk the streets with me, okay, with him and a bunch of recovering drug addicts. So you got this white guy with about six drug addicts and, and a pastor that, that he used to be a drug addict himself, okay, in recovery, and we're walking the streets, okay. Now, the, the doctor shares would make you think, well, then from there on out, I had protection, okay. No, he, they went with me like two times. Okay. And it was, it was a productive two times. Okay. But they only went with me two times. They, they weren't going to go forever. Okay. And, and I had, I didn't want to do it that way because it, it, it made me too well known in a sense, or, you know, what I like to do, I used to protect myself by getting different cars to go up there in okay, so that they wouldn't recognize the same car. And I, what I would also do is I'd only go up there for like little short spurts, maybe a half an hour, 45 minutes, okay? And I'd either interview a couple of people, ask a couple of questions, meet with the witness, which was the killer, okay? <laughs> to, to get some tips, okay? And uh, so, and, and then I'd get out of there because I figured by the time they figured that who I was there, okay? And I don't think the kid ever was going to kill me. I think his boss was going to kill me, Okay. He was nothing more than a little young runner, okay, for a bigger fish. Right. I was going to say, when you mean his boss, you mean the one supplying him with drugs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. These, 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 there's always like a kingpin that, that, that hires a bunch of these little runners. And it, supposedly when they, if they get arrested, he gets shielded. And, you know, I had to learn. I had to learn that whole network. You know, I, I got to know all the players, okay. I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah, and so stuff that the police maybe should have did, okay. But I mean, I was a fanatic. I was obsessed. Okay, but and me, meanwhile, so we're looking for a second witness. But I'm, I'm really not making much progress, and my wife is starting to get on my case. And it's not so much her, you know. She'll come to me and say, "Danny, why don't you just give it up? You know, you're going to get killed. We lost our son. We're going to lose you." And uh, most of the time I can kind of talk back into the cause and talk back into, you know, no, we, I can do this. I can do it relatively safely. Okay. And I usually could sell on it, but then the next day she talked to her girlfriends 
And all the girlfriends were saying, oh, no, he's crazy. Don't let him do it. He's going to get killed. Da, 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 da. So eventually that wears on me. And I, I really have to admit that I'm not making much progress anymore. Okay. And so I make a promise. Uh, in September is my birth date, September 17th. And my son's birthday was September 27th. And my mother's birthday was September 1st. And my mother's buried together in the same tomb with my son. Okay. So I tell my wife, I said, look, if I don't make any progress in September, okay, I'm going to quit. I'm going to let it up to God. Or I, I don't think the police are ever going to do anything, but uh, I'm going to let it up to God on the streets, whatever you want to call it. And so in any event, but I did tell her, I said, I said, and this was, you know, I told her this in, in, toward the end of August. Okay. I said, okay, next month, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it up if I can't get a breakthrough. And so uh, there was about three or four things that I wanted to try that the police had told me not to try. And uh, some of the things the police had told me not to try, I wound up trying, but there was a few I didn't get to, or maybe I also agreed with them that it could maybe hurt as much as it helped. Okay. Uh, and so in any event, I knew what I hadn't done yet. And I told her, I said, after I get this uh, answered, then, then maybe I'll shut it down. So on September 1st, which was my mother's birthday, okay, and now I'm in the month that I got to make the decision, I went to my son's grave, and I knelt this time. I always went there and prayed. Okay? This time I kneeled because they got this, like, pebbly cement, and I kneeled purposely to hurt myself, okay, and I wail. I wail, and I beg God. And what I beg God is, God, give me the strength to quit. I don't necessarily beg to, to solve the case. I mean, I'm sure it did. I'm sure I said, please help me solve the case, but I, I'm beginning to think I ain't going to solve the case either. Okay. Mr. Positive and Mr. Great Hero and all this stuff, you know, you know, you, you can lose too or feel like you're losing. Okay. And on the verge of giving up. Okay. And so I beg God to help me and my son. I even, you know, I felt like I was letting God down. I was letting my son down. I was allowing a killer to go on the street who might kill somebody else. Uh, uh, I just felt horrible about it, and I begged God to give me relief in that, okay? But I also said, hey, look, I, I'm going to try to set a couple things. Please let me have a breakthrough. I went home that same day, same day, because I went there in the morning, and I made phone calls all day. And on my last call of the day, a girl answers, and she says, I saw the whole thing. I called Crime Stoppers. I named the, the witness. So I got that breakthrough on the very first day of September on my mother's birthday. And, wow. And I, again, I got to say, some people don't go for this, but I got to say God's involved. Okay, there's, there's something going on here. Okay. And so I will say this along the way, there was lots of times I felt God help me, but... The crazy thing is I would sometimes talk to God and say, look, God, I think you're on my side. And you seem like you're helping me when I really need you. I said, but why are you making it so hard? You know, look to me, like, if you want to help me, you know, the first guy could have been the killer, okay? And it would have been over with, okay? So I don't, I don't know about all that. So, But, this is, but this, is the, this is the witness that called Crime Stoppers initially and gave the name of the young man who was the killer, but claimed to be a witness of the killer. This is the same one, right? Exactly. exactly. So how much, how much time had gone by in all this? Okay, well, uh, to a founder witness, nine months. It, 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 it seemed like longer than that, okay, when, when you live in it. But now that I look back on some of these cases I hear about, it was relatively fast. Now, although I say that, it still took another year and a half, I mean, another year and a half. Wait, no, excuse me, not a year, yeah. another about a year before we actually got him uh, sentenced. Okay. And, right. and the, witness, the witness waved back and forth about going forward, okay? You know, she, she, she didn't mind telling who killed him, okay? But she didn't want to go to court and do it because... She didn't want yeah. to go to court. She really Dan, didn't. Just a, a random question. Were you still working as a pharmacist while all this was going on? Were you still working? Uh, yes, I actually was. Now, what, what I was doing, what I did at first, maybe I might have taken two weeks off after my son's death, okay? And, and then I had a very, very uh, a compliant boss, okay, that really helped me out, okay? And he kind of got a, 
I think a little bit of a bad rub in the in the docu series, okay? Because he wasn't a bad guy at all, okay? And uh, so, any event, he he, I mean, if I needed time off, almost any time I could get it. And I initially started working maybe 20 hours a week, and then I might have went to 30, and I don't think I ever went more than 30 hours. And there were times when I needed a day off, he'd give me a day off. So uh, he 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 helped a great deal in me working the case and having the time to work the case. So. Right. And the the young man who was the killer, he did he eventually admit he did, right, that he had yes. killed your son? Yes, uh, but he was on again and off again, too. Naturally, when he was sentenced, we took a plea, plea agreement where he had agree admit that he killed my son. Okay, And then they call it manslaughter, like he killed him, but he didn't mean to kill him or his extenuating circle. I don't know how he classifies, but... Uh, so any event, uh, yes. But then he would turn around and say, no, I just, I, I just took the deal because I was afraid if we went to court, I'd spend life in prison. So he kind of cheated us a little bit on that. And, and although I was like 99.9% .9 he was the killer because I had other people and other witnesses that I couldn't bring forward. So to, to, me, to me, there was almost, there was no reasonable doubt, okay? But a jury could have maybe found reasonable doubt. Okay, which is another reason why I wound up taking the uh, uh, the deal. Okay, and so, but eventually, eventually, me and my wife went and visited him in prison. Okay, ten years after he was in prison, and he admitted he killed him. He had killed my son. Okay, and wow. he just and it's it seemed to be sincere, and it seemed like you know he was this fifteen year old kid when he kills my son. And now he's a 25 year old man and he's gotten his GED in jail. And, uh, you know, me and my son were really sort of compassionate people in a way and empathetic people. And I kind of felt like my son would have wanted me to forgive him and my Christian beliefs wanted me to forgive him. And so I was trying to forgive him. I don't know. And, and I, I kind of knew the kid and I knew, I knew what the kid's life had been. Okay. It, it, it doesn't justify what he did, okay, and I've hated him many times in the past, okay, uh, and believe it or not, I was just as disappointed almost that he lied to me as I was the fact that he killed my son. I get it. It's crazy, but you know, I mean, you know, how could you do that to me? Play me along, okay, and so, but any of that, he said something interesting, and this will help me back up the story a little bit, okay. And if we got to do a whole bunch of these things, uh, or, or we, we can roll, I, I, I can go on for a while, okay? It's a big, big story, okay? So any of that, he says, thank you for saving my life. That's what the killer says when I'm in jail. Wow. And, I, you know, honestly, I'd already figured that because all of his buddies, and I had figured out everybody who was a runner up there, almost everybody up there died in the street while he was in prison. So by putting him in prison, it saved his life. But even more than that, one time when I had it narrowed down to two killers, him and the other boy, that might have been the killer, okay? And, and the witness, I'm pretty sure at this stage, the witness had already uh, named him. So yeah, she had, okay? But you know, I didn't totally trust her at first, okay? It took me a while to really trust her and, and, and believe her, you know? And so I, at one time, this is another funny case. A couple of times I had people who were worried about me that would ride shotgun with me when I went up there. I mean, sometimes I went by myself and I did my little whatever precautions I could take. Sometimes I had the church members, okay? And sometimes I had people that were willing to ride with me. And while I would interview and question people and talk to people and put up posters and whatever I was doing, uh, they would be there with a gun, okay? And so eventually it's crazy but a neighbor down the street i live in an upper middle class uh, neighborhood uh, you know probably 250 300,000 house back then okay and one of my neighbors who live right down the street comes to me and he says you know Danny you're going to get killed up there and i said well maybe so he said no no he said, i know you are he says because i used to be a pretty big drug addict in fact i i used to deal up there Okay, I, and in fact, I lived up there for a while. In fact, I sold drugs, I took drugs, I got shot at, I got beat up, I beat up people, I shot at people. He says, it, I hate to say it, you know, nobody knows that, Harley, but I'm being honest with you. I know 
the streets up there, okay? And I'm completely recovered now. I live a normal life pretty much like you. Okay? So he's very, very honest, okay? And he says, I want to go up there with you. I'll ride shotgun with you. So he goes up there with me, I think, two times riding shotgun, and he starts losing his patience. He says, look, he says, tell you what, I got a retired drug dealer up there. <laughs> it's, it's weird because I'm in a different world. I'm this nerdy, upper-middle-class pharmacist, okay, and I got to get in this underworld to solve the case, okay? And so retire drug deal? I mean, you know, did they really retire? I mean, <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> how does that work? But, and, and, but it happens is the guy's like 75 years old. Okay. So, you know, he, 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 he is sort of, sort of retired, I guess. Okay. But he still knows everybody and he can get answers. And so this guy tells me, I'm going to bring you up to him. I'm going to introduce you to him and you can tell him your story and you can name your suspects. And I think he can find out who it is. So I sit down on the porch with this old man, old, old black man, and he says, you know, he asks all the details. I give it to him, and at the end he says, do you want me to have him killed? I remember that from, I remember that from the documentary. I remember that. I remember you saying that, and wow. And I actually had to think about it, okay? Now, what stopped me, and this gets back to the prison scene where he says, thank you for saving my life. And I don't think he knew about that time that I could have actually, for $500, had him killed, okay? But what really stopped me is my son, and I'll send you a copy of it after, okay? After this, this series, and I want you to read it, okay? My son had written a poem titled 12.01 AM. And in that poem, he, he's against the death penalty, completely against the death penalty. And then and we, we didn't discover, redis we rediscovered that poem shortly after his death with a lot of other writings that he left that we didn't know he had written, okay? And we knew he had some talent in that area, but we didn't know the degree at which he did have this talent and the amount that he wrote. The person I knew was his girlfriend who was almost his fiance, and she came to me and talked to me about his writings. And we dug them out, and I ran across 12.01 a.m. And it brought back a memory. I, I, I didn't really remember the poem exactly, but I did remember having a discussion with him one time about the death penalty. And he was completely against the death penalty, okay? And, uh, and me and him was kind of arguing almost, debating, because I was for the death penalty, okay? And so, but, but eventually I want to, uh, he's pretty stubborn. He can be pretty persistent like I am, Okay. And so I eventually say, well, Dan, I'll tell you what, maybe you're right. Maybe we should eliminate the death penalty. I said, you know why? And he, why, Dad? I said, he says, because they don't kill them fast enough. Oh, Dan. That's right. Well, he, he, gets, he gets pissed off, <laughs> okay? You know, he, he has a different outlook than I have at that time, you know. Uh, you know, and so, but I, I do explain to him, and, and this is how I felt at the time, and I, hope to think this is how many people feel, okay? It's not just about getting back, or it shouldn't be just about getting back, but if there was a true deterrent to this thing, you might could justify it. I'm not saying you can, but you might, okay? But the way they do it, the way they do it where, where they maybe eventually kill them after 13 years, okay, and they get hundreds of appeals and it costs a fortune and you house them for 13 years and then such and such, and and then the people in the neighborhood that that you could have deterred, like like when my son got killed, if, if his killer would have been executed a year or two after, it might have had effect in that neighborhood. Um, they might have actually, they might have actually, maybe I don't know, but they might have actually said, "Man, man, Jesus, this guy got killed. Uh, uh, he went to electric. I, I better not kill. Next time, I won't kill the witness or, or whatnot." Okay, but but it doesn't work that way. Okay, so so any event. So I, I, then I wound up telling him, he gets kind of mad about that. And I said, well, in any event, then I said, look, if your mom was killed or your sister was killed, you would want the death penalty? He said, no way, Dad. Unbelievable. Wow. So in any event, wow. and, and I'm against the death penalty. My son has won the argument post-mortem, okay? But what it did was, you got to read the poem. The poem kind of describes what happened. And it, it, it kind of describes my son's demise 
and the killer's demise and the conflict. And so even when we first set out to, to, to give the police the case, we thought there would be a first degree murder possibility. And we would be faced with the, the decision of life in prison or it didn't come to pass that way, but we had decided because of the poem, we was not going to go for the death penalty. We would be satisfied with life in prison. Okay. And we were doing that to honor my son's beliefs. Well, so this gets back to when the kid says, so, so when I was on that porch, when I was on that porch and I had this little decision to make, and, and I told the guy to, that I had to think about that. Okay. And he eventually gave me the name and he named the real killer. And he, he also got a confirmation that the person I thought was the killer was the killer. And the person the witness name was the killer. And he actually was the killer. Okay. Uh, it, you know, it didn't take me that long to think about it. But one of the things that it was the element was his poem. You know, I, if, if I have him killed, and then I had made these bargains with God. And part of the bargain was, God, if you help me get my son's killer off the street, okay, I'll do it the right way. I, I, I won't get him killed, okay? And I'll do it the right way. And if you protect us and nobody, no innocent people get hurt, okay, then I'll go on a mission for you. And the mission ultimately would be my drug advocacy, understanding addiction, trying to help addicts, tr tr trying to, to make a di change, make a difference, okay? And so all those factors came into me deciding against killing him, okay? But the poem had something to do with it. So I'm in a jail, and when this kid says, Mr. Danny, thank you for saving my life. I said, I didn't save your life. My son did. Wow. It's wow. true. It's true. My son saved his killer's life. This is a poem that my son wrote in 1994. Now, he was murdered in 1999. He wrote it when he, I think, was a sophomore or junior in high school. I think he was a junior. Okay, he was in a creative writing class. Okay, and uh, again, uh, I remember discussing the death penalty with him, and some kind of way he wrote this poem based upon those feelings at that time. Okay, and it's titled 12:01 a.m., and it's maybe a coincidence or not. He was pronounced dead at 12:08 a.m. Wow. Now, he died before that. And so we really don't know. He may have actually died at 1201. Maybe just truly a coincidence, but strange. Okay. So anyway, the point goes this way. 1201 AM, wrong turn. It's like a mystery story. Life burns. As Stephen King writes down his words of glory, critics rave. The body of a killer will be placed in his long awaited grave. The parents of his victims are charged a high price of admission to watch his pain, but their satisfaction is guaranteed, so everyone claims. A flip of a switch in the dark of the night, a life taken for spite. The day turns black, the light is gone, new killers are born. A director now awaits approval to promote a blockbuster hit, but in life this story just doesn't fit, or does it? Thank you for listening today. I'm sure that you will agree that what started out as a tragedy ended as redemption for Dan and his family. Please be sure and tune in to part two of Dan's story tomorrow when we talk about Dan's journey to eradicate the addiction epidemic. And yes, this is all true. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and also subscri subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narcanon Ojai. For more information on Narcanon Ojai, call 866-231-5924 or visit www.narcanonojai.org. Narcanon is a non-12-step rehabilitation program based on the works of L. Ron Hubbard.